support. Uh, good afternoon. It is my pleasure to serve as a moderator for today's program. Um, let me introduce myself. I'm Natasha Bwajes Sugiyama. I'm the director of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Um, it is my great pleasure to serve as a host and, uh, and help moderate and introduce our speaker today. Um, we are very pleased to be presenting a spring series on Japanese Latin Americans and World War II. This is the second and three part series. Um, and it's designed to complement a uh, exhibit at the Jewish Museum of Milwaukee called Then They Came For Us, or Came For Me, Incarceration of Japanese Americans During World War II and the Demise of Civil Liberties. Uh, we are very pleased to co-sponsor our series with the Jewish Museum of Milwaukee, as well as the Japanese American Citizens League Wisconsin <coughs> chapter. Um, if you have not had a chance to uh, join us for the first iteration of our conversation with Dr. Jerry Garcia, uh, Julie Klein, my colleague at Clax, will be posting a little link in the chat for you all to be able to um, learn more about the experiences of forced relocation of Japanese and Japanese Mexicans during World War II. Um, but today, I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Natasha Varner. Um, it's not often that I have an opportunity to uh, introduce another Natasha, so there are two of us today. Um, Dr. Varner has a PhD in history and is a writer with bylines at Milwaukee, I'm sorry, uh, Public Radio International, Hako Bean and Radical History Reviews online publication, The Abusable Past, and her book, La Raza Cosmetica, Beauty, Identity, and Settler Colonialism in Post-Revolutionary Mexico, which was published by the University of Arizona Press, was a finalist for the Native American and Indigenous Studies Association's Best First Book Award, uh, most recently in 2021. So her work is uh, certainly centered on Latin American studies, history, and she is based at Densho uh, and working on public engagement where she organizes community conversations, learning and actions that connect histories of Japanese American World War II incarceration to contemporary issues and instances of racism and xenophobia. So I'm very pleased to introduce Natasha Varner. Uh, I'll just say she's going to be presenting to us um, for uh, maybe about 30 to 40 minutes, and then there'll be a QA. and a um, If everyone could remember to mute their, their little icon, that would be most helpful. And you can hold your questions uh, for the end or post them in the chat. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Varner. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction, and um, thank you to all the hosts and uh, for this invitation. It's really exciting to be here. Um, and as you can tell from my my bio, my background is in Latin American history, and you know I now work at Den Show, and it's pretty rare that I have opportunities to do work to that really addresses the intersection of of my Latin American history background and um, Japanese American history. So. I'm really honored to get to share this research here today. Um, I think I'll go ahead and start sharing my screen now, if that's all right. All right, can you see that? It's all right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Great. Um, so yeah, so I'm gonna start by telling you all a little bit about um, Densho, the organization I work for. Um, Densho, let me see. Um, so Densho is a Japanese American history organization that was founded in 1996. Uh, and the original intent behind Densho was to capture the oral histories of people who had survived World War II incarceration, um, you know, recognizing that the um, survivors of this, um, of this incarceration were, you know, their stories were essential and that if work wasn't done to capture them and make sure that they were preserved for next generations, they would be lost altogether. Um, so its initial function was really to, to focus on oral histories. And a lot of what I'll be sharing today is based on um, oral history. And you know, as you'll see, 
oral histories have a way of humanizing the past and bring person bringing personal stories and experiences to life in really powerful ways. Um, but since Densho's founding in 1996, it's expanded out to include other historical items in our in our online archive. So we have, you know, government documents, letters, a lot of photographs, and other materials related to World War II incarceration history. Um, and we do primarily focus on um, Japanese American history, but we have materials and we're trying to expand our, our holdings pertaining to Japanese Latin American history and Japanese Canadian history. Um, and just over the past couple of years, especially we've added more oral histories from Japanese Latin Americans. Um, so we are trying to expand in that direction. Um, and we've also expanded our work beyond just gathering historical materials to um, speaking out about injustices that are happening in the world today that are related to Japanese American incarceration. Um, so for example, this photo on the right is Tom Ikeda, Dencho's current director at a um, protest um, in 2017, I believe, um, in response to a ruling that upheld the Muslim travel ban. Um, and so we're active in the community, not just in gathering history and making sure that this history is preserved, but also making sure that the US learns from this history and that parallels are drawn between what happened then and what's happening around us now. Um, let's see. So in today's talk, I'm gonna focus a lot on the story of Elsa Kudo. Uh, she did an oral history interview with Densho in February, 2012. Um, and the way we do oral histories is we gather, we call them life stories. You know, it's not just focused on this particular event, but gathering information about how World War II incarceration fit into their life before and after World War II. So they're typically long, long interviews. Um, and I'll, today I'm just gonna show a few clips from Elsa's interview, but we keep all this material online. It's accessible to anyone. Um, and so if you're interested, I can share links after this as well, um, so you can hear more from her. Um, but I'm going to be talking about uh, the way that Elsa's story um, fits into this larger picture of the US government um, forcibly relocating some 2200 J Japanese Latin Americans from their home countries to detention facilities in the US. Um, these individuals were taken under the pretense of a World War II prisoner exchange, but only 865 detainees were ultimately sent to Japan via the program. Several hundred others found themselves in a legal limbo, and now they're still in an ongoing battle for recognition and redress. Um, so in talking about this history, I'll be focusing primarily on the case of Peru, which is where Elsa and her family were from. Um, and in addition to talking about Elsa's uh, oral history and the um, interviews, the information she shared in that interview, I will be drawing from her father. Her father wrote a memoir um, that's a really powerful document too of his experience uh, and interviews that I conducted subsequently, um, subsequent to the 2012 interview with Elsa. Um, and also other more traditional historical materials from the Dencho archives and from other archives. Um, but I think as you'll see, you know, again, as I mentioned, the oral histories just have such a power to bring this, this history to life. And I think you'll see that the way she talks about her experience uh, really, um, I think there's a, a opportunity for um, building empathy and understanding when you hear the story directly from the people that experienced it rather than me telling you about it. So um, I think that's that's a really a beautiful thing that we have this resource available to us. So in the after, immediate aftermath of the 1941 attack on Pearl Harbor, the FBI made its first arrests of Japanese American leaders and held them in detention facilities and jails across Hawaii and the West Coast. The panic spread to Latin America too. And within the first 48 hours after Pearl Harbor, blacklists of Japanese business, businessmen, community leaders, teachers, and others appeared in Peruvian newspapers. So as the swiftness of these arrests indicate, the surveillance and tracking didn't happen overnight. 
the US government under President Franklin Delano, Delano Roosevelt had been surveilling Nikkei, so people of Japanese descent, for years in both the US and in Latin America. Central and South American presidents tried to win favor with the US um, by allowing FBI agents to be stationed at embassies to generate lists of those they deemed suspect. Peruvian President Manuel Prado was a particularly enthusiastic accomplice. After Pearl Harbor, he froze all assets held by, the, by those with Japanese citizenship and prohibited the assembly of more than three people of Japanese descent. This anti-Japanese sentiment had been in the making for at least a decade in Peru. Immigration from Japan spiked throughout Latin America after the US prohibited Japanese immigration in 1924. In 1936, Peru issued its own ban that according to historian Benjamin de Montier, reflected widespread stigmatization of Japanese immigrants as bestial, untrustworthy, militaristic, and um, this idea that they unfairly competed with Peruvians for, for wages. Um, you know, Many of these terms and ideas, of course, will sound familiar to anyone who's followed immigration sentiment in the US in recent years. As Dumontier wrote in his 2018 dissertation for the University of Arizona, pre-war anti-Japanese fervor reached a climax in a three-day race riot known as the Saqueo, targeting Japanese Peruvian individuals, homes, and businesses. And that happened in May, 1940. This resulted in approximately $1.6 million in damage and is still considered one of the most traumatic events in Japanese Peruvian history. Afterwards, tensions simmered as Peruvian authorities continued to debate how to deal with what was com commonly referred to there as the Japanese problem. So well before the World War II abduction and imprisonment of Japanese Peruvians, there were years of anti-Japanese discrimination, rumors about fifth column activity, and violent attacks and raids on Jap Japanese businesses and homes. And while some of this was driven by local attitudes towards Japanese descended people, the US government was actively stoking unfounded fears across the region. So Pearl Harbor and US led national security, quote unquote, national security measures ended up providing a lucrative solution for Peru. Although not a direct exchange for detainees, the US government lent Peru $29 million during World War II and provided military support and ships. And the paper trail indicates that President Manuel Prado was also motivated by the desire to rid Peru of all its Japanese descended citizens and residents. And you know, looking at the record, I, I argue that this amounted to a campaign of ethnic cleansing. Um, and this document here uh, really highlights that. Um, so this is a letter sent by US Ambassador uh, Henry Norweb um, in 1942, and it's documenting a visit that Prado made to the US um, in 1942. And I'm just gonna read this, this one line out loud because it's so damning. Um, hide this. So the second matter in which the president is very much interested is the possibility of getting rid of the Japanese in Peru. He would like to settle this problem permanently, which means that he's thinking in terms of, re of repatriating thousands of Japanese. He asked per Colonel Lord to let him know about the prospects of additional shipping facilities from the United States in any arrangement that might be made for the for internment of Japanese in the States, Peru would like to be sure that these Japanese would not be returned to Peru later on. The president's goal ap apparently is the su substantial elimination of the Japanese colony in Peru. Um, and so, it, yeah, it doesn't get much clearer than that, than that in terms of um, historical motivation. Um, and so even though men were the primary targets of this extraordinary rendition that, that followed this, um, their families often opted to follow them out of economic necessity, fears for safety or concern that they might not ever be reunited if they didn't take this extreme measure of volunteering for imprisonment in a foreign country. Um, and now I wanna dive in a little bit more specifically to Elsa Kudo's family story. Um, so this is the cover of her father's memoir. Um, on December 24, 1941, Seiichi Higashide, Elsa's father, was shocked to find his name on one of those lists of dangerous Axis nationals. Seiichi was a Japanese immigrant in Ica, Peru, who had built a successful business, developed deep ties to his new community, and started a family there. He wrote in his memoir, Adios to Tears, 
that shivers coursed through his body when he saw his name on that list. And he said all he could think was, can this really be true? Seichi success successfully avoided Peruvian authorities for two years, in part by digging a secret room into the floor of his home and hiding in there. But in January 1944, he was finally caught. Um, and I'm not going to share this clip from Elsa's oral history, but there's a part of it where she's remembering that her father, um, who she said was just always such a gentleman, when the authorities finally found him, he, he demanded that um, they let him hire a taxi to take him all the way from his home to Lima um, because he didn't want to ride in the, in the paddy wagon because he thought it would be so dirty um, and that he convinced them to uh, stop along the way so that he could take a portrait of himself uh, that he wanted to send back and leave with his family because he didn't know when or if ever he would ever see them again. Um, and so that memory too is just, you know, yeah, it's it's poignant and, you know, it shows a level of agency and um, will that's, I think, and resistance, you know, even in the small, the small act of resistance within this larger framework of apprehension and and detention that I think is pretty remarkable. Um, and Elsa, when we talked on the phone, said that that's still her favorite. Her favorite uh, possession is this portrait of her father. And unfortunately, um, I tried to get a copy of it and we had, uh, yeah, technical challenges to, to me getting that, but um, it's pretty incredible to know that that exists. Um, so Seichi was held in a jail in Lima and then at a US military operated prison camp in Panama and ultimately at the Crystal City detention facility in Texas for the remainder of the war. Through all of this, he had no idea where he was being taken and authorities refused to tell him why he was being apprehended and why he was being punished. And the family he left behind, um, including Elsa and her mother Angelica um, and four other siblings um, also suffered of course. So in, a phone, in the phone interview that I conducted with Elsa um, a few years ago, she vividly recalled that when authorities came to take her father away, she had this very vivid memory of running down a long hallway and um, in her family home and burying her, her face in the velvet um, black drape. And you could tell it was just this really painful visceral memory. And she said that she just couldn't stop crying. And um, she said that years later, a, a friend of the family told her, you know, Elsita, you were such a cheerful child. And after your dad was taken, I hardly ever saw you smile. Um, so that's just one glimpse into the you know, devastating impact this, this action had for the family. And Elsa's mother, Angelica, was a 27-year-old child of Japanese immigrants in Peru, pregnant with her fifth child at the time of her husband's detention. Three months after giving birth, Angelica received an urgent telegram from her husband instructing her to bring the family to Texas so they could be reunited at the Crystal City Detention Facility. So she had to quickly sell off all the family's uh, items and um, sell off its, its shop and all its inventory. She and her five children, along with her parents and sister, left their home and boarded one of the last US military ships to leave Peru with de de detainees and other voluntary internees who were following family members into captivity. Um, and now I'm gonna show you one of the oral history clips. Um, and this just gives one little glimpse into how challenging this, uh, this experience was. So again, this is Elsa Kudo. Remember the voyage? Did you oh yes. Uh, I don't. You know, I don't remember the voyage to Kayal, but on the ship, my mother tells me um, that because the child was only like three months old, but she could not nurse like she nursed all of us. And so I think it was all that emotional trauma that she couldn't have milk. <clears throat> and so she bought a lot of uh, pet milk, carnation milk, and stuffed it in the luggage. But we did not receive, she said she never had the notice, maybe being in a smaller town. Uh, my husband's family said, oh, and they got information that you cannot pack any food of any type but she didn't know it. And she was thinking about the children too. So she packed it. Well, when we got to Callao, they dumped all of that. So she didn't have anything. And that's when, when she told me later 
that here she was trying to feed the baby and only blood would come to her breast. And uh, so she begged the American soldier, please, plead it. Well, she didn't know English. So she would plead in Spanish, please milk for my baby. And he would pretend not to understand. I mean, how stupid can you be? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just very prejudice, prejudicial. But later when a Filipino soldier got on guard, then she said, por favor, you know, in Spanish, uh, give me some milk for my baby. And he, he did for her. So from that time on, she had milk. Mm, um, that still makes me so angry to hear, hear that memory. It's so, so painful. Um, and in other parts of that oral history also talks about um, the horrible smell of the wax on the lifesavers they had to wear, um, you know, being stuffed into a narrow room on the ship um, where they were forced to keep the windows shut and the lights off. Um, she said that occasionally she and other children were allowed to run around on the deck. Um, and she said she remembers these playtimes as being some of the few happy moments of the trip. Uh, she also says that she tried American food for the first time on, on this ship to the US, um, specifically hot dogs and sauerkraut. And she did not have fond memories of those things. Um, so that was her, her welcome to the US. Um, Do you remember oh, sorry. Um, so once the Higashides were finally reunited in the US, they were imprisoned alongside other enemy aliens and their families at the Crystal City Detention Facility. They lived in rustic barracks with no insulation. Um, and during the summer months, their temperatures outside could reach upwards of 120 degrees. In his memoir, Seichi recalls the barracks becoming a hellish oven with metal bed frames that got so hot you couldn't touch them without blistering. So it's, yeah, I can't imagine having five young children running around in that kind of environment. It sounds horrible. They were held alongside some 4,000 men, women, and children who were imprisoned at Crystal City during its six years of operation, often forced to perform unpaid work. For children, the schools and the camp lacked funding, books, and teachers. And when the war ended, the Higashide family didn't leave their troubles behind. They just got new ones. Um, along with hundreds of other Japanese Latin Americans, they found themselves in a stateless legal limbo after the war. In September 1945, US President Harry Truman issued a pro proclamation authorizing the removal of all enemy aliens from US soil, but Peru only allowed those with Peruvian citizenship to return. And though none of the de detainees were ever found guilty of espionage or any other crimes, newspaper headlines characterized those who returned to Peru as, quote, leaders of the Japanese fifth co column. So you can imagine that was not a hospitable place to return to. Um, and also given the policies of, of ethnic cleansing that preceded it, um, I can imagine why people would be reluctant to return there. In all, only 80 Japanese Peruvians retu returned to the country that had been their home. Another 900 relocated to Japan where they had to start, restart their lives in a place many of them had never been to and um, many of them didn't speak Japanese either. So they were in a foreign land and unable to even communicate in the, the language there. The Higashides and several hundred other Japanese Latin Americans were able to stay in the US thanks to legal action taken by civil rights attorneys Wayne Collins and A.L. Weirin. The lawyers first won a court order blocking the removal of 364 Japanese Peruvians, then secured temporary pr permission for them to remain as laborers at Seabook. Seabrook Farms, a major producer of frozen and canned foods in New Jersey. But they were still undocumented and considered illegal aliens in their government paperwork. In September 1946, the Higashide family relocated to Seabrook Farms to work alongside hundreds of others, other displaced Nikkei from the US and Latin America. And Seichi wrote in his memoir, the transfer to this place from our former life behind barbed wire fences was no more than a shift from complete confinement to partial confinement. Um, and, you know, in some of the other oral histories I've listened to, people talked about Seabrook and, you know, in other areas, the time immediately after World War II as being worse in some ways than the formal incarceration because 
their conditions were still really dire and they had to fend for themselves in terms of housing, food, and other basic necessities. Um, so they were provided ho housing, but remembered it being worse than the barracks they lived in at Crystal City. Low wages were taxed heavily at Seabrook and the workers had little choice but to buy food at inflated prices from the company store because Seabrook Farms was very isolated. The Higashide's youngest son, Richard, was born at Seabrook, and Elsa recalls that her family was so poor there that her mother had to make clothing out of the baby's cloth diapers once he outgrew them. I'm just going to share another oral history from um, oral history clip from Elsa to, um, where she's talking a little bit about her experience at Seabrook. My mother, because she had so many little ones, had to work where she could come running to feed the children or the child. Uh, at that time, I think Richard was born. And <clears throat> so she did like, um, uh, there were buildings just for the single men. And so she would have to clean their latrine. And that's when also she got heckled by some member saying, that's so demeaning. But, but my dad told her, and she would cry sometimes, you know, um, and she would say, but I have to do this because then it allowed me to see the children and, and make sure they're okay. Well, my, what my father said then was, it's an honest job. It has to be done and you're not doing anything wrong. So be proud. Don't be ashamed that you're doing this kind of work. You know, it's an honest work. And so that made her feel better, I think. And so she did. So by this time, there were six children. Six children, yeah. Sorry, I don't think you can hear the interviewer that well, but she was just asking it, um, or she was just confirming that there were six children in the family at that time. Mother was working mm -hmm. and also taking care of the children. Mm -hmm. What was your father doing this time? So she said, your mother was working and also trying to take care of the children. Um, what was your father doing at this time? Uh, just about everything, you know. Um, I think he was in the, um, what is that called? The the conveyor belt where they have to pick very quickly, throw away all the uh, junky veggies and keep the good ones and do those kind of things. and Or carry crates from one place to another. All types, all kinds of work. Whatever was there, he would do it. Um, so yeah, that's, you know, clearly more focused on Elsa's parents' experience, but you can just imagine, um, you know, how challenging it would have been for this family who was um, relatively well off and comfortable in Peru to have gone through this uh, forced removal life in a, um, you know, concentration camp in Texas, and then be in a situation where they don't have citizenship, um, they're, you know, stateless and have to go work on this giant um, factory farm, essentially. Um, so the Hikashide stayed at Seabrook for two years before they were eventually able to relocate to Chicago. Um, and for several years, the family of eight lived in extreme poverty there with Angelica working factory jobs and Seichi continuing, continuing to take whatever work he could find. And um, Chicago's restrictive housing laws made it nearly impossible to rent a large enough home for the family. So they eventually were able to secure enough loans and um, purchase properties that they could live in and also rent out to others in their predicament. Um, and Elsa did enough babysitting. Oh, I think I meant to actually go to this next slide, sorry. Um, this is not Elsa, but this, these are other images from post-war Chicago from the Densho archives um, and from the Japanese American Museum of Oregon. Um, so Elsa did enough babysitting to eventually put herself through college at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Um, and so it seemed like things, you know, as a young woman, things were finally getting back on track and she was probably able to finally envision what a life that she wanted to build here. Um, but that's when she found out that she was still in a very precarious situation in the US. And I think this next oral history cl clip is the last one I'll show, um, but it really drives home um, how this experience landed for her. And now this is where I'm really upset that the US government had branded all of us 
illegal aliens or illegal entry. And I didn't know about it until I was a junior in college and I was called uh, to get my citizenship papers. I had to pass a test in front of this judge. And I think because I was a college student, he asked questions that most people would not be able to answer. And I said, oh no, I'm gonna flunk this one. You know? <laughs> but somehow I made it. And that's when he brought out my FBI file. That's what really, I know being younger, I said, what is this? Why is my file stamped illegal entry? We didn't come illegally. You folks knew we were coming in. You brought us here. I was so upset. That was the first time I saw that we were stamped illegal entry. Mm -hmm. now this oh, sorry. Um, so, sorry, actually, I'll stay on that slide for a second. Um, you know, there were many moments in conducting this, this research that I felt physically ill because it's just so unjust. And this was definitely one of them. You know, it's just, it's not surprising, unfortunately, given the history of US racism and xenophobia and other actions it's taken. But when you read into the history of um, individuals who lived through it and the way that experience landed for them, um, it's just extremely upsetting. Um, and unfortunately, the, the kind of long trajectory of injustice for Japanese Peruvians didn't end there at all. Um, for the Kudo family, for Elsa and her family, things got a little bit calmer. Um, so by the 1970s, she was able to relocate to Hawaii with her husband, um, who was also Japanese Peruvian, but had been able to secure citizenship because he served in the US military. Um, they started a family there and eventually her parents and several siblings followed them there. So um, as life got a little bit easier for Elsa and her family, uh, there were other struggles that were ongoing. Um, and those stories are, are really encapsulated best through the story of Art Shibayama. So like Elsa, Isamu Carlos Arturo Shibayama, who went as Art, was relocated from Peru to Crystal City as a child. He also lived at Seabrook Farms with his family after the war and was similarly deemed illegal by the US government. Even so, he was drafted into the US Army in 1952 and re required to serve the country that had conspired to abduct and imprison his family and then denied them citizenship. And while he was stationed in Germany, Shibayama's superior officer applied for US citizenship on his behalf, but the US government declared him ineligible, claiming that he had entered the US illegally. Provisions made in the Immigration Act of 1952 allowed Japanese Latin Americans and others who'd been banned by racially exclusionary immigration laws to finally become eligible for citizenship. But because of this illegal status, um, the path to actually obtaining that citizenship was still extremely complicated. You know, some Japanese Latin Americans were able to become citizens in the 1950s um, after the Immigration Act was passed. But Art and others um, didn't re receive their citizenship until 19, the 1970s. And so it was you know, decades of trying to advocate and work through multiple um, yeah, bureaucracies and, and offices to um, attain citizenship. And as Japanese Americans fought for redress over the course of the 1970s and 80s, um, Japanese Latin Americans fought alongside them. Um, Japanese Americans from the US finally won an official presidential policy or apology and individual payments of $20,000 through the Civil Liberties Act of 1988. But here too, Japanese Latin Americans were told they didn't qualify for redress because of their supposed illegal entry. This repeated denial of rights and redress on account of the illegal status is common thread throughout the Japanese Peruvian experience in the US. Um, and it's just infuriating when you think about the irony there that you know these people were kidnapped, brought here through extraordinary rendition, and then um, charged with being illegal. So an organization called the Campaign for Justice filed a class action lawsuit in 1996. Um, okay. 
Um, sorry. Okay. So an organization called the Campaign for Justice filed a class action lawsuit in 1996 that resulted in an out of court settlement that promised $5,000 to each of the Japanese Latin American survivors. Art Shibayama called the lower individual payments um, compared to the $20,000 that Japanese American survivors had received a slap in the face. Um, and Shibayama and others refused to accept that settlement. Other Japanese Latin Americans never received checks because the Office of Redress Administration ran out of funds after paying only 145 of the claimants. So 500 eligible claimants um, didn't receive anything because of mismanagement essentially. So just another injustice layered on top of all the other injustices in the story. Shibayama and his two brothers filed five additional lawsuits and helped craft two pieces of legislation none of which were successful. In 2003, the Shibayama brothers filed a petition with the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. That I, I'll refer to that from now on as the IACHR, arguing that crimes had occurred under the American Declaration of the Rights and Duties of Man, to which the US was a signatory in 1948. Their case was finally heard in Washington, DC, um, 14 years later in March, 2017, but the Trump administration refused to participate in the hearings. After the 2017 hearings, the IACHR, IACHR sorry, <laughs> officially offered personal apologies and agreed to investigate. But Shibayama died in July, 2018 at the age of 88, two years before the commission would issue its ruling. Finally, in April, 2020, they issued the, the ruling, I'll, I have it up on the screen, but um, in summary, they conclude that the US was responsible for the violation of the rights to equality and issued recommend, recommended actions that included monetary reparations and other measures created in conversation with the affected parties. And they also recommended um, that the US declassify and make available any records related to this abduction and detention. Um, since then, the Biden has, administration has yet to comply with this ruling, um, but in February of this year, um, Biden became the first president to acknowledge the plight of Japanese Latin Americans in his presidential Day of Remembrance proclamation. Um, so you can see in that highlighted section there that, you know, this is a, a pretty major historical moment that he, that it was finally acknowledged by a president. Um, so it's, Amazing that it's finally happened, but also uh, pretty awful that it took this long for it to even be acknowledged. So the Cam Campaign for Justice is still active today and they've organized community days of action to advocate what they consider to be the crucial next steps. Um, and the, these next steps include securing a meeting with the Biden administration to discuss compliance with the IACHR ruling um, working with Congress to develop legislation to comp comply with this decision, mobilizing for education and redress action, and building solidarity among, uh, among our communities by making connections in our histories and justice struggles. Um, and I really, you know, if, if you all take any action after this talk today, I would really recommend you visiting this website and following um, the campaign for justice on social media. Um, they're doing pretty remarkable work and uh, they still need a lot of community support. And um, yeah, anything you can do to kind of raise this, raise their, their cause is um, welcomed. Um, so this is Grace Shimizu. She's the co-founder of the campaign for justice and also the Japanese Peruvian oral history project. Um, she was born in the 1950s in Berkeley, California. And her father was a Japanese Peruvian businessman who, like Seichi, was blacklisted and forcibly relocated to the US. Um, since the early 1990s, Shimizu has worked to document and expose the little known US program of extraordinary rendition and to secure redress for those victimized by it. Um, she also does a lot to draw the connections between her family's history and the constitutional and humanitarian challenges and violations we face today. Um, and she, in an interview, shared this, this quote. She said, redress isn't finished. It's a human rights issue. And this unfinished World War II business is important to us all. Um, so in other words, she thinks there are, um, that 
finally granting justice to Japanese Peruvians and other Japanese Latin Americans will have implications for um, the US government owning its uh, complicity in these actions and giving grounds for holding them more accountable in contemporary cases. Um, so she plays a key role in linking Japanese Peruvian plight to other social justice struggles. Um, and in March of 2019, I was able to join her and a number of other Japanese Latin American survivors and their descendants on a pilgrimage back to Crystal City. Um, and she's standing here on the left. Um, and, you know, there's very little that remains of the Crystal City detention facility. Now it's basically just um, the foundation of a pool that was once there. Um, and it's actually a really um, kind of bittersweet remembrance because there was a tragic incident in the war where two young Japanese Peruvian girls who were detained at Crystal City drowned in that pool. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's um, I think, meaningful and um, really painful that that's one of the few remains of this camp. Um, so when we were there in 2019, there was a memorial service that was held at the site of the pool, not just for the two girls who had drowned there, but for all the um, Japanese Latin Americans and other detainees at Crystal City who had lost their lives there. Um, and for many of the people who were in attendance, um, who were survivors, it was their first time returning to the site. Um, so it was really beautiful. And, um, you know, you could see the, the visible emotion on the faces of a lot of the people that were in attendance. Um, and one thing that was really remarkable and remains remarkable to me today is, you know, um, this commemoration of what happened at Crystal City um, isn't just about acknowledging the past, but it's brought into the present in really profound ways. And so right after the ceremony um, at the former site of Crystal City, uh, survivors and their descendants drove down the road to the South Texas residential uh, family residential center in Dilly, Texas, um, which is the largest, the U.S.'s largest um, immigration detention facility. And at the time, there were some 2,200 um, women and children being detained there. Um, and they they joined in a protest um, held by Sudu for Solidarity and other grassroots organizations where they were speaking out against the, the detentions and the kind of similar denial of rights and um, just denial of the humanity of the people being held there. Um, and, you know, I talked to several people there too, and they said, you know, this happened to us and, you know, it's our duty to make sure this doesn't happen to other people. And I've heard that sentiment um, throughout many of the Japanese American communities that I've engaged with through Densho. And it always strikes me as, as you know, that being the, um, the ethic that all Americans should adopt. It's really, really remarkable to me. But in the case of Japanese Latin Americans, the fact that they're still having to fight for redress and recognition for their own cause, and that they're making space um, for building sol solidarity and standing up for the rights of others, um, it, it still really moves me. Um, so I'm going to end there. But yeah, I just want to encourage you all to support the Campaign for Justice and um, continue to learn more about this history. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Varner, for uh, really an enlightening um, uh, and provocative presentation. I think that a lot of us learned a lot. There were a couple of quick questions that emerged from the chat, but I'm sure there are lots of others. Um, if you could say a little bit about how Peru um, treated other um, groups and if there were German Peruvians or others and, and you know maybe how uh, the experiences of the uh, Japanese Peruvians differed um, or not relative to other groups that were also um, deemed uh, hostile to our uh, to World War II. Um, I actually don't know the answer to that question. I, you know, yeah, I haven't widely studied Peruvian history. Um, sure. If, if you or anybody else on this call has more information, I'd welcome um, somebody else chiming in here. Okay. Um, 
I, I think I have one, if I may <laughs> take the chair's prerogative. Um, uh, you told us a little bit about the what happened at the end of the war when Crystal City um, was vacated and um, some 80 um, Japanese Peruvians returned to Peru and another 900 went to Japan and some stayed in the United States. I I'm wondering if in your oral history project or elsewhere, you've learned a little bit about how that sorting took place. In other words, um, were people um, able, do they have any choice in the matter about whether or not they went to Japan or whether they went to Peru? And um, how did families feel about, uh, you know, those who stayed in the United States? Were they um, happy about that relative to other options, if they had any op options? Yeah, I'm, mainly what I'm familiar with is um, just some individual cases. And I know that each one of those, and you know, that's through oral histories and through talking to people today. In each of those cases, um, there was a lot of uncertainty and um, lack of clarity, even on the family level, about what was going to be the best for the family. And um, in some ways, it was almost like you know, finding the right, um, like finding a path that felt supportive, is what dictate it where the family ended up. So there was another um, oral history that we just recently added to our collection where um, a, another family from P Peru ended up in the Bay Area because they found a um, pastor that sponsored the family and gave them housing. You know, so it was kind of like, and this is, yeah, another one of the upsetting things. It was just like, we're gonna bring you here and force you into detention and then you sort out the, I mean, I can't even imagine navigating the like logistical, legal, um, yeah, the hurdles that existed between multiple countries. Um, and so, yeah, I think it was a matter of, yeah, finding the best way to self-advocate. Um, that was a, a huge part of it. Yeah. We've had some comments about how this is such a, a story that's so overlooked in the core curriculum. Um, and so since Densho has so much on its website, I wonder if you could speak a little bit to, you know, maybe how um, we can either uh, learn more on our own or how educators um, can use the resources at the uh, available on the website at Densho to illuminate this history for our students, um, either K through 12 or, or beyond. Yeah, I, I mean, we have such a struggle with just getting like solid um, Japanese American history into, um, yeah, into the hands of teachers. So that feels like a major hurdle. And um, I think that adding this story is really important. We haven't done that yet, um, but I feel like, yeah, probably just a couple oral histories and synopsis of, of what happened in, in these cases would be really valuable. Um, so thank you to whoever added that comment. I, I actually um, do a lot with Dentro's education program. So I will take that, that comment to heart. Okay. Um, we had a couple of questions about uh, the relative, ex you know, size of Japanese Peruvians compared to Japanese Brazilians and Mexicans. Um, I'll plug the presentation that um, Dr. Jerry Garcia did earlier for us where he, he did talk a little bit about general patterns. And I'll also plug that we have Dr. Jeff Lesser who will be giving his talk on May 11th on the experiences of Japanese Brazilians. So, um, I, mean, I don't know if you wanted to, to give a comparative overview, but I wanted to let you off the hook in case that isn't one of your items that we, we have more to come and we've had a little bit of, of some of that um, leading up to that. Thanks, yeah, I'm, um, I'm planning to attend the talk in a couple of weeks because I don't know that much about, I mean, yeah, I, I know that there was, um, a history of detention for Japanese Brazilians, but I think it was mainly in Brazil. Um, and so, yeah, I, I don't feel like I can speak knowledgeably to the, the comparative issue, but um, 
I know that among the um, the groups brought to the U.S., I believe that um, that Japanese Peruvians were the largest portion of the Japanese Latin Americans actually brought to the U.S. and detained here. Um, and I think, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but from what I know about um, Japanese Mexicans, most of the detention was there in Mexico. I, I wasn't able to attend uh, Dr. Garcia's talk, but. Yeah, and I see Julie Klein just put the link in the chat. So for those of you who um, wanna grab that link, um, please feel free. We have a YouTube channel. Um, so UWM clocks, and you'll be able to find um, a lot of our programming there if you don't quite catch that URL. Um, and then we're, I guess there are some questions about updates, updates on redress on the Biden administration, um, what kind of reception you're seeing on, on this front? Um, the last I heard was, you know, there was a big um, day of action, I believe on um, February 24th or um, somewhere around then. Um, and so a big push to get the Biden administration to acknowledge this history and, you know, take more steps beyond just acknowledging it in his um, presidential letter. But I haven't heard anything um, since then um, from, from the, um, from the group. And I um, tried to connect with Grace Shimizu again. And um, as you can imagine, she's extremely busy running a lot of, uh, oh, sorry, um, a lot of parallel campaigns and other um, campaigns for justice. And so unfortunately she and I weren't able to connect before this, but I think that's one of the reasons I really encourage people to look to um, the um, campaign for justice website and social media because they keep those relatively updated. So that that's a more reliable source for new information and updates. Okay. Um, Karen Holden is asking about um, if you could say a little bit about the 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 migration to Peru and um, what were the leading factors that led Japanese to migrate to Peru and um, how it might have been um, driven by desires for economic opportunity or other factors. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm gonna share a link to a blog post that my colleague Nina Wallace just put together uh, yesterday. Um, and it's a new, we have a new collection in the Densho archives that documents Japanese Peruvian life um, just prior to the war and, um, and afterwards as well. Um, but yeah, she, um, so in this blog post, she talks about how Peru established um, diplomatic relationships with, um, with Japan. And so through that, they were able to bring contract laborers starting in the late 1800s. Um, and so there were a lot of there was a lot of um, migration for that reason to work on plantations in, in Peru. And so you can read more about that on um, in the link I just shared. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, if you have a chance to look at that as well, the, the photographic collection um, that's highlighted there is pretty remarkable and also kind of gives a glimpse into pre-war um, Japanese Peruvian life. So Natasha, there, there is a question here about whether or not there are any Okinawan Latin American experiences in the oral history project. And I guess one of the questions that that maybe made me think about is, you know, how do you, who gets into the project and how do you think about um, whose oral histories get incorporated and how do you find subjects? Um, so a little bit about maybe the background of uh, what's incorporated and how you, you make those decisions. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I think, you know, there are definitely descendants of Okinawa that are um, represented in the archives. We haven't like documented Okinawan history in particular in that way, but um, we do try to have a diverse representation of experiences in the oral histories we do. I think initially, you know, it was trying to just build up a, a baseline um, 
you know, body of resources about people's experiences. And then as that grew over time, we started to see, you know, there are kind of gaps in this history and, you know, we wanted to make sure we were able to get voices that weren't as represented, you know, so we have, we do have a, um, nomination process where people can nominate themselves or a family member to conduct an oral history with Densho. And it's somewhat comprehensive in terms of the information they have to fill out. Um, and of course, it's always challenging to turn people away from that because every story matters, of course, and every story is unique. Um, but yeah, at this point, you know, it is pretty time and labor um, intensive for us to conduct these oral histories. So we have to be pretty selective. Um, and you know, we just, we had to pause our oral history program for most of the first two years of the pandemic and we're just now getting up to steam, up to speed again. And so right now it's partly just like, who do we have access to? You know, there are not that many um, direct survivors of World War II incarceration anymore. And many of them who are still living were very young, um, you know, children or teenagers during the war. And so those are very specific parts of that experience. And in some, in some cases, um, people have kind of sunny memories of, oh, well, I got, it was like, you know, going to a sleepover that lasted for three years, you know, like they were, they have these memories of, of playing and weren't privy to the hardship of the experience in the same way that people who were adults were. Um, and so I'd say right now we're trying to make sure that we're getting, um, the, you know, the kind of older generation um, while we still can and focusing on that. Um, but even within that, still trying to capture stories that, that aren't told as often mm -hmm. that answers that question. So I know our time is running short. I don't know if you, I, I think you can probably see the chat as well as I can, if there are any other items you feel like you can address um, as we wrap up. I yeah, I mean, this last question, I think um, I can speak to just on an individual scale, not, um, but yeah, it, when I was at this pilgrimage a couple of years ago at Crystal City, um, there were several generations of, of one family there. Um, and it, I, I know that the, the younger generations, the Yonsei from that family are still very active in, um, you know, preserving their family history and bringing this Japanese Latin American component of it um, to light as much as possible. Um, and so, yeah, I, I know that that is happening. I don't know how like broad that, that work is, although I do believe that um, some of the people involved in the um, campaign for justice are younger and that they're you know, getting involved in, in making sure that their um, kind of family's legacy is preserved and, and that there's um, some level of accountability for it. Now, the, in many ways, the items we didn't get to touch on from the chat are our marching orders at CLACS for future programming, future opportunities for us to explore topics and um, uh, you know, answering some more questions about what happened in Peru and how Peru responded. So um, I hope we'll come back to this audience again with more information and um, new programming. And I, I thank Dr. Natasha Werner for your time. And I thank the audience for joining us. It has been a tremendous um, response um, from you all. And we are so in incredibly thankful for everyone's energy and time and, and interest. Um, I've learned Tremendously, thank you so much for your your wisdom today. Um, I'll go ahead and I'll plug the last of our spring series, uh, which will be on Wednesday, May 11th at 2 p.m. So there is a difference. It's 2 p.m. Central, um, and that talk will be on the experiences of Japanese immigrants and Japanese Brazilians in Brazil um, from 1930 to 1954, um, and will be joined by Dr. Jeffrey Lesser. So. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thank you, everyone. <laughs>